Hello! We should be here. I hope we are. Hello! Welcome to Band of Badgers. I am Dave, your host for this session, and joining us as our Q&A guest this time is Mr. J.D. Wicker from WizKids. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> good, good stuff. Um, Steve, do we do we have you, Steve? Yeah, you have me, and we have sound, and oh. we are live. Oh, right, right. even better. We have... We have that's, Three ticks in the boxes. That's great. <laughs> now, um, now, if you don't know, uh, or if you didn't know, JD is the RP producer, RPG producer, not RP producer, RPG producer for WizKids, but is also a writer, a game designer, a gamer um, for for like us, pretty much our entire lives, really. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna get more into that in a second. Steve, as you know, me, Steve. <laughs> Steve is Steve. Steve is the co-host. So if you have a question for JD, please do put it into live chat. Um, thank you to everyone who sent in your questions. We have got them. We have compiled them. Uh, Steve's going to shout some out. I'm going to shout some out. Uh, but right now, JD has already been warned. Um, <laughs> so we're going to jump straight in. And and the very, very first question is, what is the game? Um, what, is, what is the game? The game that got you hooked into gaming wow uh that's that's a very very long story um we have an hour we have plenty uh, of time we're good okay but that doesn't leave much room for other questions um <laughs> <laughs> no when i was a kid uh i think i started playing games at a very young age i can still remember playing games like Candyland with my family and we had a regular Friday night was game night in our household. And so we had Candyland, we had Life, we had Monopoly, all of those games. And as the rest of my family got less interested in games, I got more interested in games. Um, and I started seeing games in stores and games in magazines that I wanted to try. I cannot remember the name of the, of the game that I ordered from the back of uh, uh, Future Life magazine way back in the day. Um, but I do remember in the mid seventies, uh, getting my parents to buy me, uh, the Avalon Hill Starship Troopers. Ooh, board yes. Game. Um, and, uh, it was a bit over my head at the time, but, uh, I, I quickly figured it out. And, um, I think I played against an actual opponent maybe once, <laughs> um, <laughs> but shortly after that, uh, I, I got the idea of designing my own games. And so I was out buying game pieces, or as other people would call them, miniatures. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and the clerk at the store said, oh, I see you're buying all these miniatures. Do you play Dungeons and Dragons? And I said, what's Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so he took me to that part of the store and showed me. And he, that was when the, <laughs> like, the blue box, the starter set was first yep. out. He, uh, he, 1977 he your, or so? He becomes yeah. your Elminster. Come this way. To a whole new yes. world. <laughs> a whole new world of plastic and imagination. So, yeah, that uh, that was the start. That's right. You mentioned um, uh, Avalon Hill. What was the other series? They did a few series of different games. I've got I, a... I did. Uh, what, did they, what did they become? Panzer did they Leader, Panzer Blitz, Squad Leader. Yeah, yeah. They got, they got absorbed by Hasbro. Um, and it actually happened, I was at uh, a convention for game designers, like at the, right at the beginning of Gen Con, like the few days before Gen Con. And I think that was in, I want to say 1997. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of them worked for Avalon Hill and uh, he got a call while he was there saying, hey, uh, thought you should know, uh, Hasbro has just acquired Avalon Hill and uh, we're all out of jobs. Oh. Um, yeah, but uh, I think that got sorted out. Um, and then eventually Avalon Hill sort of got folded into Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. Um, because, you know, games, mm -hmm. that makes sense, right? It's, yeah. not, it's not a plastic uh, action figure, so therefore it falls into the category of games. And what Wizards mean, of the Coast should handle that, right? So, so that's when, what happened to them, I think. When did you... Um, how did you get into gaming as a career? So we've had a lot of questions coming in. Uh, again, thank you to everyone who sent in questions. We always get asked, um, when we have creators on, writers, artists, creators, game designers, we always get asked what it was your background. Did you, uh, who was it who was an archeologist? Someone we had on was an archeologist. Now, now they're a game designer. 
And it's it's you know we've had psychologists. Oh, but Clint, I'm, Clint I'm a trained as an archaeologist. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of um, like wow. How do you change from something <laughs> that you kind of went into education, university, college, whatever, and switch to gaming? How does that happen? So uh, a lot of questions we get in are about education. What was your background? Was that something that was was gaming always a hobby? Or gaming was you, always a hobby. And then you studied something different? <laughs> studied is uh, an interesting way of putting it. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, am a, I am a high school graduate. And uh, college after high school held no interest for me whatsoever. In fact, I saw several of my friends who went away to college give up on it and come back. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I had concluded uh, anything I really need to know I can find in the library. I can I can find a book at the bookstore that, that will explain it to me. That's not true. That has not quite worked out for me as well as one would hope. <laughs> um, I wish I had uh, uh, studied statistics, for example. Yeah. Um, but mostly what I did in the time between discovering the existence of Dungeons and Dragons and the time that I started working on role-playing games, uh, mostly what I did was just ordinary jobs, you know, blue collar work. I yeah. worked at gas stations. I, I worked uh, for a while in the uh, computer lab at the convention center where Gen Con is held um, way before Gen Con was held there. Um, so yeah, I've just sort of bounced all over the place. Um, yeah, uh, it, getting into the actual game design industry, um, I, in my gaming group, I had somebody who was a professional game designer for TSR and other companies. He put me in touch with somebody who was looking for more writers because he thought that I could handle it. I was running games and he enjoyed the game, so he thought that makes sense. Um, and that kind of went nowhere, but um, when I started working for Wizards of the Coast in customer service, um, which was just a purely coincidental thing, I, I just happened to be playing in a completely different game with a friend who said, I'm going to start working in customer service at Wizards. I'm going to move to Seattle. Do you want to go along? Maybe we can get you hired as well. Sure, I'll go. Um, so I moved from Indianapolis, Indiana to Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. started working at, at Wizards of the Coast and customer service, literally down to my last nickel when I got the call. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd found that in the couch cushions. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, that's where, that's where started, the loose changes. That's the best place to go. That's right. My couch cushions, other people's couch cushions. <laughs> hey, can I come over tonight? I just want to sit on your couch for a while. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, once I started working at um, Wizards of the Coast and customer service, um, it quickly became uh, uh, knowledge that uh, I, I was really interested in the game Ars Magica. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, Wizards of the Coast owned that property. Um, and so the guy who was uh, the lead developer for that came to me and said, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to work on this uh, aside from just answering questions about it in customer service? Sure. And so I wrote the, uh, the return of the storm writer uh, jumpstart kit uh, for that. <clears throat> and I worked on a couple of other things for it over mm -hmm. time, but uh, none of those got published before we actually, uh, <laughs> Uh, lost the, the game to somebody else was it when, when you talk about customer services is that thing people like i don't understand the game or i'm stuck on the game how do i get past this bit how do i the rules don't quite make sense at the time how do i really at the wow. time it was purely magic the gathering oh um almost nobody ever called about any of the role-playing games that was just the coast down so what we would get would, would be people calling and saying hey uh you know my opponent wants to play this i want to play that and then he responds with this, what happens? Mm -hmm. And so we would just, you know, we would look through our books of cards and we would have, you know, things on the screen that we could look at and say, this is a very common question. Here's the, the correct answer to it. But it literally was just answering phone calls all day long. Um, there was also social media. Yeah. So at the time I was the America online representative for, for customer service. Yeah. Um, uh, somewhere out there, there's probably an archive of me giving answers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, you know, eventually we, we started uh, Vampire the Eternal Struggle. We had uh, uh, the Netrunner game, um, the card game. Um, Robo Rally came along. Um, so we were answering questions for all of those games. Um, but uh, to explain how I went from 
answering questions uh, on the phone to you know being a game designer uh, after having written a couple of ex you know expansions adventures that sort of thing mm -hmm. um, purely as a freelance uh, a freelancer um, wizards acquired TSR mm -hmm. um, and after they had been with us for about six months um, I was using my computer at the office after hours to work on uh, a, a source book for Ars Magica. And one of the RPG team from TSR walked by to go to the restroom and she stopped to talk to me for a few minutes. And on the way back, she said, what are you, why are you here so late? There are no calls at this hour, right? And I said, well, I'm actually just borrowing the computer working on something for not Wizards of the Coast. And so we started talking about it. She said, you design RPGs? <laughs> you know, we have an opening in the RPG team, right? <laughs> um, and so I applied. And they actually hired a few of us from inside the company, cool. uh, mostly customer service people. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I suddenly one day found myself working on D&D uh, &D and Alternity, Dark Matter. Um, and then Star Wars came along uh, because we got the license for that. And the reason I got involved was because apparently nobody else raised their hand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. We were we were in literally in a meeting, and the the head of our uh, RPG the, the RPG team, uh, Bill Slavasek, uh, said, "Hey, if anybody is interested, uh, you know, let me know, and we'll get you on the on the Star Wars team." And I started to raise my hand, and I thought, ah, "It's been a really long time since Star Wars for me, you know, so I'm probably not the best person for this." And so I just you know sat sat back down again. And then the following week, we were having a, a meeting with. Um, the, uh, the team that I specifically worked on with Mike Selinker and Mike Selinker, who was the lead of that team said, so by the way, Bill has not yet gotten anybody uh, to volunteer to work on star Wars. So if you're interested and I said, are we done with the meeting? Cause I need to go talk to Bill. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so, yeah, I just hopped up and went over to Bill's office and said, Hey, if you're still looking for a designer, I, I volunteer as tribute. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I became a star Wars designer uh, in the course of about, you know, 12 hours. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's one of those things, it's a strange thing because like, we were talking about this before we kind of went on air where um, we've all kind of grown up with Star Wars in our lives. We, we're a very much a pop culture generation. Um, anything from 70s, 80s is just ingrained in us. And yes. I think as, as them... As us, as kids, as we've become adults, we've taken that love of that fantasy and sci-fi and just made it into something else entirely. It's, it's a weird, it's a weird kind of revival because everyone says, oh yeah, that was great there. But no, because like like anything, the, the people who have grown up inspired by the people who created those stories are creating the stories now that everyone else is going to be inspired by later on. And technology continues to grow and... Uh, define what our capabilities are and we continue to push against them which I absolutely love the mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Star Wars but how I mean this was after the prequel trilogy is out or around the same time around the same time okay. um, while I was a member of the of the RPG team mm -hmm. they took us to go see Phantom Menace in the theater yeah um, and we were working on a Star Wars RPG at that time the so how does that work because in your in your head there's when star wars the original trilogy comes out that is very much a closed off universe mm -hmm. and novels and uh stories that have come out after that period were not as inspiring stories you then get um this new trilogy which says here's some more here's some more it's a different time period Here's some more characters to play with. This is when the Jedi's were on a high. Does that give you more stuff to play with or does it kind of lock you down even more? How do you create a story? Like you have to pick particular time periods. Well, we didn't oh, um, right. okay. because they wanted us to, to cover both time periods. Uh, you know, the, the old Republic yeah. and then you know, the, the rebellion era. Um, and 
the the strangest part about all of that was that part of the extended universe for for Star Wars included a bunch of comic books, um, the Dark Empire series from the, yeah. I want to say mid '80s. Um, and so when I worked, actually, I've got it right here. When I worked on the uh, on this, uh, if you can yeah. see that, the Dark Side Source book, um, that drew heavily from those comics because that was mostly about all of that. Um, but the thing that we had to do, of course, was to uh, differentiate um the, the time periods right we could say this this character exists in this time period this equipment exists in this time period um this character class only exists in this time period <laughs> um uh so the trickiest part about working on that um and it really showed up with attack of the clones because we saw we saw the script for that before we started working, but we didn't actually see the movie um, until afterward. Um, but things happened. The Jedi were able to do things in that movie that they hadn't ever shown that they could do before. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, jumping through traffic in that early scene where they would, you know, they would cover half a kilometer with a single jump. Yep. You it's, know, it's we're looking at our rules. Open. Yay! Yeah. We're doing, and I'll land safely. <laughs> yeah. And we were looking at our rules and saying. You can't do that in our rule set. Oh my gosh, <laughs> what do we do? Um, so yeah, that was that became a kind of a, an ongoing nightmare. Every time a new, a new movie would come out, we would go, okay, hopefully we've got everything covered this time. <laughs> and you know we're going to have to explain a lot to cinematic license. But um, do, do you think that's why? Uh, so spoilers, anyone? Book of Boba Fett um, is that is that why we we see Luke Skywalker teaching Baby Yoda jumping? <laughs> is it? Oh, probably. That, that's why. So, what's your first power? <laughs> Jump in. If Yoda can do it, you can do it. If, if if Anakin can do it, you can do it too. So, yeah. I suspect. Yeah, it it seems to be you know the equivalent of uh, uh, you know all of the scenes you see in um, uh, you know the montages you see yeah. in movies where somebody you know goes through this intense physical training. And it's always, you know, running, jumping, et cetera. You know, so it's it's kind of a callback to Empire Strikes Back. Yep. You know, great, Luke, you're gonna we're gonna train you to be a Jedi. You already know how to run and jump, but we're gonna teach you how to do it better. <laughs> with a <laughs> with a Yoda on your back. Yes. <laughs> you're gonna do it with a backpack. There you, there you go. <laughs> you're talking about um, you know, some of the things you had to be concerned on with a, that set of movies coming out. Um, if you were writing it today, would you consider it to be even more difficult? Because you've got you've got so much more. You've got the series, you've got the films, you've got the the computer games, which are canon stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the animated series. I mean, there's a whole raft of things you need to pull on. I was, I was I was going to take that a bit a step further. I was going to say, um, JD, do you do you have any inside information to Kenobi? No. Have they, have, they, have they used any past, past scripts that have been floating around and filed somewhere in like a, a dusty drawer and gone, I, J.D. Wicker I... wrote this. <laughs> let's, just, let's just get Kenobi. You know, it's funny. I, I, I sometimes wonder, I used to say when um, Attack of the Clones came out, right, and we saw uh, the advertising for that and, mm. you know, how it was all, you know, the Jedi Code says you must not have relationships and you, you can't know love. And uh, I had actually just written an article for, I think, the first or second issue of Star Wars Gamer, um, which was, you know, the magazine that, that we produced yeah. at Wizards of the Coast to support the, the RPG, uh, about the Jedi Code. And I like to joke that eh, up until that point, um, I was probably responsible for about 90% of the actual written Jedi Code. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they've added anything to it since then. But, but that's, you know, that's why they named you, uh, we were talking about your uh, gaming name. And we yeah, used to, Jedi to, Waker. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that happened because I was answering questions for um, all the various internet forums, uh, and the people who you know commented there started referring to me as Jedi Waker because J D Waker. It's just a couple of extra vowels, you know. But yeah, when I left the company uh, and uh, I started playing uh, online video games. Uh, just all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, I said, you know, all of these people that that you know always wanted to talk to me when I was working at Wizards, I'm out here. If they want to find me, I'm Jedi Waker on this channel or that channel or whatever. And I that's been that way for 20 years now. Were you were you playing Star Wars games? 
Well, <laughs> I can't honestly remember the last Star Wars game that I played. I, I really can't. I'm... I really want to try um, the uh, the games from uh, Atomic Mass. Yeah. Um, but I've invested so, so much in the Marvel Crisis Protocol games that I'm like, okay, I need to finish those miniatures before I start buying a completely different game to play. <laughs> but they look fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I saw somebody playing with one of those once at a, at a, a game store here. And oh my God, they just look amazing. Definitely. The, um, so we're going we're gonna to wing it back to um, the, the item that's on your t-shirt. Um, you yes. are now at WizKids. Yes, and indeed. the the latest product um, is Dungeons Dragons Frameworks, mm -hmm. which uh, for anyone watching this, uh, we have a playlist on our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash of Badgers. We have a playlist there, all about introducing you to the new frameworks, which are sprue-based miniatures. Uh, so you have to cut them out, glue them together, prime them, paint them. And uh, one day they may look as good as the pictures that you can see in the right hand <laughs> of your screen. Um, so the, these yeah. photos have been provided by Den of Imagination, and they are amazing. Again, JD, we were talking about this before. I mean, they're just that. So we'll forget about the introduction. The um, the <laughs> level of detail on these miniatures is incredible. They really are. How um, I, and I mentioned this before. How how has that changed over pre over recent years? So not just these new frameworks. We've seen WizKids in, in recent years, even during pandemic, the the pre-painted minis seem to be much sharper. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the detail on them is incredible. The dynamic poses are more dynamic, are, are even better. You've got so much more going on. And we did, make, we, were, we were already talking about this before we went live, that everything has changed. The materials, the way we do things, software. Um, is it continuing to be, I mean, like on, on screen right now, we have this kind of gladiator, like almost Roman-esque Wonder Woman kind of character. The, the level of detail on these minis is incredible. How how do, how do you continue to do that? Um, there, there's a whole pile of questions here. Who are the artists? Is it in-house? Is it external? If it's external, what? how do you pick artists? How do you find your new artists? There's um, a lot to unpack here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so <clears throat> partly what we've done with frameworks that we, we haven't quite done with the uh, pre-painted or the unpainted lines, the Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures, um, yeah. Pathfinder Battles, uh, Deep Cuts, WizKids Deep Cuts. Part of what we do with frameworks is we actually have concept artists um, and we give them some direction and say, hey, we'd like, you know, uh, we'd like the Balor to be, you know, standing up with you know wings outstretched and you know yeah. lots of fire uh, effects and that sort of thing and then the concept artist takes that away and comes back and says how do you like this and then you know we make a few adjustments here and there i don't think we made any adjustments on the valor by the way <laughs> um, uh, the, the artist for that is a guy named tom babby um and uh, hey. hopefully tom babby has, has just joined us oh there um, he is I'm gonna. Hi, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna skip through the photos we've got coming on, and I'll pause it on the battle. There we go. Hang on, I've got it here. So yeah, Tom has done a lot of uh, uh, artwork for Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. Um, he's a he's a extremely talented artist. Yes, I am talking about you, Tom. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, Tom has been just a dream to work with. Um, and he put us on to a couple of other people, uh, uh, Tyler Walpole uh, and Jacob Walker, who actually, strangely enough, I used to work with uh, Jacob. He was a freelancer, uh, freelance artist when I was working uh, uh, with the Game Mechanics, which is the company I started after I left Wizards of the Coast. We did D20 system yeah. supplements and so forth. Anyway, uh, Jacob has been one of our, uh, is it, is it going to show there? Um, Jacob, Jacob has been one of our, um, our concept artists uh, for the Pathfinder line and the WizKids line. Yeah. Oh, that looks fantastic, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, the packaging is lovely. It, and... it says miniature on the box, but it's anything other than miniature. Yeah, yeah this massive, massive guy. So yeah, um, so Tom did the concept artist for, or did the, the concept art for all of Wave 1. Um, uh, and everything there is something that we, you know, we we talked about, we iterated on, we talked to the sculpting team and said, 
we want to do this. Can you make that happen? And we talked to the factory, um, which is uh, located in Hong Kong, um, and said, this is what we'd like to do with this. Can you make this happen? A um, lot of back and forth with mm -hmm. uh, factories and sculpting teams and concept artists, uh, product teams, the whole the whole gamut. Um, and this is the result. This is you know what we've gotten out of that. Um, and I think it's I think it's like you said, the detail is amazing. Um, uh, I think the sculpts, the poses are all fantastic. Tom came up with a lot of really cool little elements um that you know we hadn't even suggested because that's just how tom's brain works because he's always that creative <laughs> yeah um he is always out there you know adding some little element like you know i i'm 90 percent certain that the um the mountain goat on the stone giant's shoulder uh was entirely him um that that was uh, strange because when i saw that on the box i was like and one of the options is a, is a goat <laughs> <laughs> and i was like is that really a goat <laughs> it's, yeah, that's really a, a goat and yeah. you know the cow the cow the is giant i mean the cow <laughs> is like oh my god what is going on but it was uh that so for those of you who don't know about frameworks um you don't just get you get one model one base model but you get a variety of options so uh weapons heads um it's it gives you a little bit more variety but you have to kind of uh you've got to choose what you want to do but, yes. Yeah, that that wagon over the shoulder and carrying carrying a cow <laughs> by a leg was just incredible. Um, so yeah, that's 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 Tom, right? And, you know, Tom came up with a lot of that. I I pitched him a few ideas here and there where we come up with things like um, uh, we're going to have some interesting stuff uh, with uh, a flesh golem um, at some point. Um, and I'm not sure Tom may have actually sent me the sketches for that already, but uh, we've talked a lot about things we want to add to that to make it uh, more interesting. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's the process, right? So then once once we get that from the, the concept artist, we hand it over to the sculpting team. Um, they take a look, they make comments, you know, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, can we add something here? Um, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we hand, they hand that off to freelance sculptors, contractors. Um, and for the, strangely enough, you know, the, you're talking about the uh, the painted miniatures that Den of Imagination did. Den of Imagination also does sculpting, so they've done a lot of the sculpting for the frameworks line. So they're intimately familiar with these when they start to paint them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, on the subject of the hill giant, they had sculpted into, sculpted in some elements that I said, ah, let's not put that there. I don't like that. And they said, okay. And then they when they painted it, they went ahead and added it right back in. <laughs> I said, okay, fine. Um, I, I can tell you guys like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, then we get uh, digital files from them. We send the digital files once we approve them, of course, and when Wizards of the Coast has to approve these, just like, you know, when we do Pathfinder stuff and we do yep. Critical Role stuff, um, yep. they will also have to approve those. Um, but then they go to the factory and the factory, you know, kind of sorts through them and says, okay, we can, you know, we can make this cut here and then that will lay flat in the, in the mold, et cetera. Um, and then they send us a, an image of the sprue and say, are you okay with this layout? Mm -hmm. And then from that point on, it's just little tweaks here and there. And then they send us samples. And so and well, say, uh, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the flesh golem. Is, is that mm -hmm. going to be something we can expect in wave two? A little later. Wave two is well into production now. Oh, okay. So we've got to, so wave one, as we know, is thirty odd miniature. Well, miniatures. It's a range of different sizes. It's it's a it's you've got heroes, you've got villains, uh, you've got uh, large, you've got bosses, um, and a big boss. Squads. Yep, and the squads, the the fat packs. Um, what is what is it? I mean, there's there has been delays. So what is what's the issue with all the international shipping? Is that still causing issues but you mentioned wave two is now in, in production yes um so mostly the delays have been due to shipping issues um not everything especially in a set this large yeah um, and we saw this with uh unpainted miniatures as well because we would get uh you know some of the nulzer stuff and some of the, the pathfinder stuff at the same time but then something else from either of those sets would be on a completely different ship and that ship would be delayed or the yeah. cargo would take longer to unload or load. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's taken us so long. But this is also an, an entirely new category for us. Mm. 
for whiz kids, right? So we're, we're kind of feeling our way out and we, we, we have people who are familiar, um, with all of these stages of, of the process. Um, and it's kind of my job to coordinate them. Yeah. Um, but at times it is a bit like herding cats, you know, everybody has this thing that they want to try. They want to do, they, you know, they have great ideas and you have to go through and say, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. We have to make that happen. Uh, and then there's times where you have to say, uh, <laughs> I don't yep. think that's going to be well received. Maybe we should not do that. Um, but ultimately what it boils down to is that we work with a lot of different people who take a specific amount of time to do their job before they can pass their part of it on to the next person yep. in the assembly line, so to speak. Um, and yeah, it, it just takes time. I mean, we, this is something that I started working on. Um, when I first started with the company, which was mm -hmm. November of 2020. Um, so it's, it's taken us a while, but the things we've learned from doing wave one have meant that wave two will come out much more quickly. Um, yeah. and we're looking at that towards the end of this year. We, uh, I'm going to see if there's any spoilers here we can dig up. Um, we mentioned, uh, so we've had, we've had chats off camera as well before this, um, and we've been talking on email that, so that, again, just to reiterate to everyone, these minis are on uh, sprues. So you get your pack and then you'll get, sorry about the noise, then you'll get something like that. Okay. Now on the smaller ones, um, there's sometimes you get a bit of space. And on that space, uh, WizKids has been very clever and started to put in, you might get a magical effect or you might get a like a tombstone, something to dress the base um, or dungeon terrain or something like that you can, you can use, which is, which is really, really nice to see. Are we going to see more of that? Are, are these ideas just continue to evolve in wave two, wave three? Do you, do you have yes. a plan of how <laughs> many waves they're going to be? Um, no more than we have a plan of how many Nolzers waves there will be. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it essentially boils down to, well, if people lose interest. I guess we'll stop, um, sort of like making, you know, Austin Powers movies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. We're adding things constantly. In fact, um, some of the feedback we've gotten so far in just the last couple months has indicated that people would like to see more of those spare parts. They want to see things that they yeah. can use. And I spent a good part of my day yesterday going through and just evaluating lists of parts that we have suggested um, and trying to figure out ways to add more of those to every single frame that we put out. Hmm. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, there will definitely be more of those. There will be more stuff that's um, very thematic to the figure at hand. There will be stuff that's sort of generic so that you can, you know, take that and put it on a completely different miniature if you like. Is is there any limitation? So you've got a complete um, a complete balor there. And you can mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like a hand plus two hands kind of thing. Are you gonna go bigger? Because that's that's the largest size, isn't it? That's the largest oh he's he's, he's not in people, he's not in. He didn't say it out loud, but he's nodding. <laughs> if you listen, this, yeah. if you listen to this on audio, he's <laughs> nodding. <laughs> there, there so, will definitely be bigger figures. Um, you can, you can expect to start seeing dragons. Really? Yes. Wow. Oh, yes. I know Steve's just gone. Ding, ding. <laughs> Steve's like, <laughs> I'm gonna get the dragons. <laughs> it's a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, that, that, I, I actually really got excited about the uh, the generic add-ons. Um, I, I like that. I like having the extra bits. So I, I've put together some of the miniature ones because we're playing uh, Witchlight. So I've put yes. together the miniatures for, for our Witchlight game. And cool. um, this is me for the first time ever building this type of, of miniature. You know, I've done painting before. We do, we do uh, the Whiskey's painting on, on our... Uh, the great British brush, brush off show and I do a lot of painting anyway this is the first time me putting stuff together it was a learning experience um, and starting with the small ones was I did find it quite hard um, because I had no experience so you learn a lot doing the first few that you put together and um, now they're primed I think they look great they look really good so I'm going to start painting them um, tomorrow I'm not, it's not going to show. I'll, I'll turn the screen off and put it up again in a minute. But 
I, I did look at the bits that were left over and thinking, oh, I really want to use that on something else. Particularly, uh, so I've got the, the Orc Barbarian here, and the Orc Barbarian's got a couple of extra weapons, got the double-handed axe, and I'm thinking, oh, I really want to use that somewhere else. Well, what can I use it on? And I think I might be using some of them bits to decorate the bases on the larger models. Mm -hmm. But some of them are very specific to some of the miniatures uh, that you've got. So you're kind of like sitting there thinking, well, don't know what I can use it on because I don't have another body that, that really goes with that particular mm -hmm. weapon or, or, or pose or, or the arm or the shape of the arm. Um, so having more of generic pieces where you can decorate, I think, is a really, really good move and direction to to, to go in because there are some you know there are some really good poses that's that's the warlock that's my character it's, you know, that's the tiefling effects. warlock tiefling warlock yeah with, yeah. The, with the um technicals coming out of the back that looks great <laughs> i'm looking forward to playing them um yeah so ha having having the generic pieces where you can do the decoration is great because they these are dave said this as well actually um these are to me not miniatures like you would Get, like the deep cuts, the nozzles, and, and the pathfinder battles, they're not necessarily miniatures. They are models because you're putting them together. Mm -hmm. You're you're putting that extra little bit of love, care, and attention into it, and you start thinking about what well, I'm going to take that mold line up for. Well, I've got a bit of a gap there. I'm going to going to put some green stuff in it and make it look as pristine as possible. Spend a little bit more time painting it and and having the dungeon dressing and maybe putting it a little. Me, after you finish playing with it in, in that particular game, put in a little diorama, you know, put it on a little, a nice little base, put it on the shelf, and it's something to, to display. It's a little bit more than just a miniature that you can pull off the shelf, uh, and you know, everybody has. This is this is unique. You can make it unique. You can change the angle of the arm. Um, so Mike Mike Balls in um, in in chat, he plays in um, our Witchlight campaign. He's got a copy of the of the Barbarian. He's used the same weapons that I have, but he's put the axe in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. So they're not the same. It's the same model, it's not the same. Yeah, you know, it's it's, <laughs> it's it makes it look slightly di dynamic, slightly different. Um, and I, I really like that. I think they're great. Well, glad to hear that. <laughs> you know, that's that's the goal, right? <laughs> is is there any way you can do? Um variations on a theme because we're looking at basically you can just reprint the, the monster manual and we now we have the new monster manuals coming out and all kinds of cosmic creatures are we going to see the because it's icons it's still part of the is it icons of the realm oh no technically i guess it's not icons no. of the realm icons so, of the realm is a very specific yeah. sub brand i guess so of the painted minis could we see um, some of the new monsters coming into into this rather than just the classics? Okay, that's oh, yeah. it. He's oh, not yeah. in. He's not. I'm not yes, that's right. <laughs> he's, he's not in. <laughs> no, that's that, that's cool. And again, the, you, we can't. We keep saying this, and we we said this during the unboxing videos. The the level of detail. The, these things are deep. Um, and when you see me doing the unboxings, I've got a I've got a pencil with me, and you can literally see how deep these things are. And this Balor has. Uh, he has an eight pack. <laughs> and he, this guy is ripped. Okay. He, he yeah, is... I, I was the model for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's see, what, see what Tom says about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it is. There is an incredible amount of detail, and the I don't know how they print this or make it or whatever, but that you can see. You can't. You, you won't be able to see it on this camera. Go to the unboxing video. You'll check it out. But there is, uh, he's got his two legs basically on on a sprue here, and you can see his bony toes, and he has long toenails, and those toenails are sharp. This is this these things, and and we and we keep saying it enough that they are. Yes, they're they're a model, they're a piece of art. You can paint it, you enjoy painting it, and when you put this onto your gaming table, your players are. Anytime you put a painted mini onto a table, your players go, oh, that's what we're going to fight. When you put one of these on, the amount of definition on these things is just incredible. I mean, they've got like jewelry. You can see jewelry. You can see studs in the leather. You can see one of the heroes, I think, had stitching on the, like the, the, the saddlebag thing. So I've got a story for you about that, um, about the level of detail. So early on, um, while we were working on the, um, the the four figures from the sneak preview, uh, the orc barbarian, the the elf ranger, uh, the dwarf cleric, the human druid, um, 
uh, my boss uh, was saying, I don't know if we have enough detail on these figures. Um, you know, <laughs> we're getting a lot of people saying, you know, we need to make the, we need to give it more definition, yeah. right? Make the, make the gaps deeper in various places. So it's really clear that you can see things. And so I had gotten all four of those uh, figures um, to assemble and try out. Um, they, they like printed them up in polyurethane, which is not the same material it is now. This is high impact polystyrene. Um, but yeah, they, they printed these in poly, uh, polyurethane and I put the uh, dwarf cleric together and I just started like, as I normally do, I decided mm -hmm. to paint her head um, just to kind of see, you know, how the detail was. Yeah. And as I was doing that, I realized I could count her individual teeth. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. And so I, I, I took a, a close up photo of that and I sent it back to my boss and I said, I think the level of detail is probably fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can stop cutting. <laughs> wow. I mean, it, it, it is insane. So we've got three waves so far. Are we going to wave four? Are we going to, are we going to? There will be a wave four. Oh, there we go. We got, we, uh, at we, least I we, hope so. I mean, I spent a lot of time, you know, writing up a set list for that. Uh, fantastic. <laughs> we've also got Tom. Tom is in live chat. He's, uh, he, Tom yes. is the uh, artist behind this. Uh, he's, he has confirmed. He, you were the uh, uh, reference material because you sent him photos. <laughs> there were photos from when I was younger, but you're sure. <laughs> there you go. Um, and uh, JD, yeah. Just, well, anytime you want to hang out and 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 uh, paint or whatever, just uh, just let us know. We're happy to have you on. Oh, absolutely. I'd love um, to. I mean, you know, I, I am here at my painting table as we speak. <laughs> yeah. We, 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 I mean, so Tom's has has his uh, Tom, Tom JD has his own uh, studio there as you can see in the background. We've got a a lot of details, and you have the the JD Wicker fan page on uh, on yeah. Facebook that people can find you. You yes. have um, I don't know if you got it to hand, but you had a photo or a selection of photos of a purple dragon. I actually do have that. Hold on one moment. Okay. That it, it did look amazing. It's a series of photos of this re uh, rearing dragon. There we go on a stone. There we go the stone base, the stonework. Oh wow! So this is a, a figure that somebody uh, asked me to do for them. Um, it's a resin three D printed miniature um, that I had to assemble. Like all of those wings came in multiple pieces. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, this has been my uh, most recent project, um, and he's finished. Yeah. Um, I just need to, uh, you know, actually arrange to get this to the uh, to the client. But um, yeah, this has been my my painting project lately. So is that this is, is a that a mixture of paints and spray paint? Um, there, there's quite a bit of airbrushing here. Yeah. That's um, and and is that did you three D print that one yourself? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm terrible at that. <laughs> so how? I have how the, in terms of like 3D printers are a thing now, um, widely yeah. accessible um, for those that, for, for when they work. Um, how, <laughs> how has that changed the market for companies like WizKids? Well, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. Um, I hear a lot of people uh, commenting that they're not interested in this line of miniatures, the, the frameworks line because they can just 3D print whatever they want at home. And I'm, I think that's, that's great. That's awesome for you. Um, but not everybody can do that. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a 3D printer right over there. You know, I can see it from here. Um, I, I rarely ever use it because it's, uh, somebody else compared them to um, early automobiles. Yeah. Um, they require much more time maintaining them to make sure they actually run properly mm -hmm. than you actually spend operating them. Um, and I would rather be sitting over here painting myself. Yep. Yeah. So I don't really want to invest that time in, you know, cleaning and scrubbing and, you know, calibrating and all of that with that printer. I've, I've heard exactly. That was the thing that put me off as well. It was, it was the amount of setup time. And there were so many people who have gone, I couldn't get to work. And what's this? Oh, if you put a pencil under it, it works. Like what? Well, that's not, <laughs> that's, that's not how you're supposed to do it, is it? Um, oh, yeah, if you just tweak this and overflow and this does this. It's like, yeah, but I just want to, and and it take oh you have to leave it on overnight but don't worry if it gets hot it just bursts into flames like, <laughs> no how how are you going to control this thing um, it just seems impossible but I I've always been a a, a fan of um, 
I think it's miniatures because of the board games. When you get the D&D board games from, from years ago, you always got the miniatures and you always come with the same color. Everything is like red or blue or whatever. Um, but it's just... Very difficult of board games. Yes. And it, 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 it's cheap, it's mass produced, it's fine. But it having, like you say, trying to find things to put on the board just adds an extra level of immersion, of imagination. And you, you see that in your own head. It, it's a, you know, the cinema inside. And since when we were playing D and D, uh, when was it? What back in the eighties? It was between all of us, the group of us who were playing it. We had one DM uh, DM book, Dungeon Master's Guide, because mm-hmm. we couldn't all afford it. We were kids; we couldn't all afford it. We didn't have, we didn't buy the adventures because who can buy that? We might have got the monsters manual for someone's Christmas present, um, but you made it up. That was the whole point. It's imagination. <clears throat> you go into a cave. There's a tunnel. In the tunnel, there's something horrible. And you fight it, and you win, and you get treasure. And then you go and buy more magic item, and it, it just escalates. As, um, you know, from a kid into a big into a big kid, and you, you, have, you get you know, wages and money, you can then kind of uh, explore different ways of spending your money by buying <laughs> things that support that habit. And that is miniatures. And you get, oh, that's me as a player. It's like that's my character, that is me, and I'm going to be that character. And then, over a period of time, the character dies, or that you change adventure, or whatever. Oh, now I want a new character. Now, I, oh, this is me now. I'm, I'm in a mood to be a barbarian, or a knight in heavy armor. And then, when you make the move to, to being a DM, or GM, it's like, well, now I need monsters, because if I like having my character, I then I want to have a monster, and then you want to maybe I'll buy the Beholder because that's really going to terrify my players when I put that down. Mm-hmm. And it's, again, as, as this has gone on and companies have um, come up and just got better and better and better producing these horrifying monsters, um, I just love it even more. And there, there's just there's just so much out there. There's, and, and here's the thing, when we used to see when we used to see dragons, they were always sleeping. <laughs> yes. we used to, they, they were always like, they're curled up and sleeping. And they're like, yeah, it's a dragon, but it's not exactly a terrifying dragon. And we talked about dynamic poses. Now we see them uh, like the Balor. The Balor is, he's floating and he's got the flame whip and it's actually on fire. Yeah. There is, um one of the options for the Balor is he has that kind of uh, Hellboy flaming crown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is it, it's just incredible, and you can have, you know, That's a dragon. <laughs> yeah, and for whiz kids, we've seen the whole host of dragons, uh, the metallic dragons, the undead dragon. Oh wow, that was incredible! But a dragon, um, I think, with the blue dragon, is, is rearing up, and now we have we have uh, breath options. Mm-hmm. Is you have this lightning breath coming out, and it's it's just. It's, it, you can imagine it's, it's, it wings are out it's floating above the ground above the heroes because they're going to be tiny mm-hmm. and we've seen for example Tiamat Tiamat is what a two a two foot wingspan which is just incredible are we going to see a, a frameworks a frameworks Tiamat oh, that's an interesting idea um, I'm not sure that people will go for that but uh Wow, that would make a, a really it, interesting. Item. It would be an interesting. Again, we talk about a model hobby where you can you can spend. And I've really again. So Steve and uh, and Joe from our brush off show, they're the ones who got me into painting because mm-hmm. it was like I didn't want to get into another hobby. And only through, only through inviting guests on to learn how to paint with our guests, professional right. painters from around the world, I've gone. Oh, okay, yeah, I can I can start to understand. But it's very. Even though we're doing it as a show, it's very zen. It, it you just like forget everything. It's very calming. Um, you can take it. You can go and paint in the garden if you want to, and just take everything. My little boy is is kind of getting into it now. He's watching me do it, and I'm hoping that the frameworks is just that extra level of where I can I can choose, especially with frameworks. I can choose what my model is going to be like. I have some options, and it it. That that level of detail, I just think is um, is something I want to continue with. That's my next level of the hobby, I think, uh, in mm-hmm. terms of miniatures. I, I I had a question actually. 
Um, with these miniatures and the frameworks putting stuff together, you've had vehicles in some of your other ranges. Uh, is there a possibility of getting vehicles in, in the frameworks range? Yeah. It's always a possibility. Ooh. Oh, I, oh, um, I, I... The larger things get, the more complex it gets to yeah. create them. Um, you can only fit so much on any given mold, and each mold is just, to my mind, outrageously expensive. But, um, you know, you can print a lot on any given any given mold. Um, so it is a possibility. Like, you, you know, you talked about the possibility of a, of a Frameworks Tiamat. That would be amazing. Um, but I, I'm thinking about that and, and imagining the size of the mold necessary to get that two foot wingspan we could do a you smaller, a, a smaller you have to do like you know yeah. part of a wing here and then part of a wing there and mm. each one gets its own separate tool that starts to get really complex after a while you know maybe it's best to to do those just with uh you know the unpainted versions the painted versions mm. the the um the pvc plastic yeah. um but you know it is very tempting you know, I think about all the things we could do with the high impact polystyrene and, you know, it, it, it performs to my mind so much better than, than PVC because you don't see that, um, that same kind of sag that you do, um, the bendability that you have to, you know, get out your, your hot air gun and warm <laughs> it up and then yeah. reposition it, dunk it in ice cold water, all of that. Um, I mean, you know, like we're talking about with this, with this Baylor, um, you know, he's kind of balanced just on his, on his feet on top mm. of this this bit of flame you know and the wing sticking up like this this piece you know that's just connected here at the wing yeah and comes up and hangs over his head it's not actually touching any part of his head oh wow you know okay so that's all stuff that we can do with this but if we had done this in pvc it would eventually you know yeah. be you know his crown will be hanging over the front of his face um so it gives us a lot of options to build more rigid structures and more delicate structures. Um, you know, we, uh, Tom had put together a, uh, a sketch for a giant um, that is standing on one foot. Um, and we talked about, you know, with the sculptors, are we going to be able to pull this off? Is, the, is this, the factory going to be able to mold this in such a way that it's not going to collapse as soon as somebody puts it on the table? Um, you know, or leaves it sitting on their, their shelf for a few months. Um, and yeah, the high impact polystyrene will let us do that. And that's, that's fantastic. And I think it's going to be also really useful to make much lighter versions of some of the heavier things like vehicles, like ships, like, you know, if we decide to do something in a more modern frame, you know, that, we could do cars. That was my question is, is frameworks. So the way the waves we're getting now, is that a Dungeons and Dragons license? Is this always frameworks a whiz kids thing? So frameworks is a Dungeons and Dragons thing. Okay. Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons, frameworks. Um, the whiz kids line, uh, I don't think we've announced what we're going to call that yet, so I won't I won't say it out loud here. Or for that matter, the Pathfinder line or the Critical Role line, they have they have separate names, they have separate yeah. brands. Um, so they will be a different product line. If we should decide to do something like a, a like a modern figure, like a car or a boat or whatever. Um, that would probably be under the Whiz Kids aegis. Yeah, I, I was thinking more along the lines of uh, Starfinder, because Starfinder, you could do spaceships and yep, and then you could do well scale boat. Um, yeah, or can you do other? Can you do Star Trek and Star Wars? Uh, presumably, if we get a license for it. <laughs> so I mean. It's, 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 wow. I mean, just thinking about, um, so when I was a kid and, and got into models, uh, I, I think every kid goes through it. Um, do you, do, do you have Airfix in the States? So in the UK, we had a models called, model company called Airfix. And that was, uh, uh, Air Force jets. You had <laughs> boats and submarines. It's very military, modern military things. Um, I would love to do like a, in terms of the frameworks sprue model, the Millennium Falcon or an X-Wing fighter or something like that could be really, really cool. And then what variations could you put on that? I don't know, but yeah, that'd be cool. You get a little R2 maybe <laughs> for next, so you get the X-Wing and then one of the extras as an R2. You can plonk that, it in. That it. would be nice. That would be a lovely dream. Um, 
Yeah, I think that those are probably uh, thoroughly licensed well, now here licensed. in the United yeah. States. Um, the last I heard, I mean, I still actually have in my closet here in the in the craft room um, uh, the old Ravel. Uh, yeah, Ravel. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got um, I've got the Millennium Falcon. I've got an X Wing. I think I have Darth Vader's Tie Fighter. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, that I've just never gotten around to building. I also have the um, the APC from Aliens. See that'd be another good one. <laughs> See well, again, they, uh, there's I lines. Think, I think the alien license expired when um, the AVP board game went out of print because you can still buy uh, their uh, sprue based models to put together. And I have a few of those for our alien RPG game, but they're horrendously expensive buying them yes. on, on eBay <laughs> and Kickstarter. So I think that's our license. So that would be very cool <laughs> to those models because alien RPG is, is quite big in a moment as well. It's just yeah. a question of getting licenses, yeah. you know, and sadly that's not my department or there would be a lot of things I would be out there. <laughs> <laughs> again, it's, it's the, uh, it's the pop culture revival. It's, it's getting things again where we, we work is now just big kids. We still want to, um, uh have those have those connections and everything else uh we're coming we're wrapping up to the end of it if um you have a question in live chat for jd do let us know put it into live chat now or forever hold your peace of course you can catch us up on uh youtube.com slash bad badgers um but jd oh, i've got a question go ahead um what uh what creature would you like to add that you haven't added yet. What's what's the uh, what's the one you would there's, there's really some spoilers want to do? coming. This is where we want to get to some spoilers, <laughs> some teasing. <laughs> we've, we've, had, uh, we've, had, we've heard oh, about the flesh right. Yeah, um, you're trying to get me to to talk about things that I've added to set lists or that I've made in future add to set lists. <laughs> what's the first thing you add to a set list? Oh, uh, you know the the funny thing is that um, I have to approach it in kind of a systematic way. Um, because I recognize that every time we do a set list for uh, uh, frameworks or for Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures, which is you know one of the other products I work on, um, I have to start by planning out the paint kit. Oh. Right, okay. Um, we kind of did that backwards with frameworks where we selected from the available models and came up with the, the Dryder paint kit that you'll eventually see. Um, I think that's been solicited. I'm, I hope so, because otherwise I just gave it away. Um, you, you heard it but... potentially first here, folks. <laughs> there we go. But each time, you know, I, I look at that and I say, okay, we, we need a paint kit figure, right? And uh, with the Nolzers, it's always two. Um, we yeah. have two every every wave. Um, the um, uh, the next thing on the on a frameworks kit though, or a frameworks wave set list, um, yeah, that one um, is coming up with. Uh, the the big figure for the set, mm -hmm. right? You know, so we had the Balor with Wave One, and you can imagine that uh, Dragon is probably going to be the big figure yeah. for Wave Two. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you were going that direction, that's that's what I would do. But uh, yeah, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would love to work on something, you know, considerably larger. Has, um, has there been a, a discussion at WizKids? She you know, these are miniatures and models for, for tabletop gaming. Mm -hmm. But has has there been any, I suppose you can use them for anything, but like um, like busts of some of the characters. So a larger size bust. I mean, I've got a, a large kind of microphone in front of me or the size of a glass where you just have maybe uh, like drist. So just a kind of head and shoulders bust with the two swords that kind of thing so it's not a playing piece it's, it's decorative but in right there are things like that that we uh have talked about um i don't know that we would do those in a, a sprue based miniature format mm -hmm. um but i mean certainly we've got uh, a lot of things coming out like you've probably seen in uh, game stores i know a lot of game stores uh, pick up the um the dragon heads that we've done yeah yeah um, so we've certainly got stuff like that in the works. We call those lifestyle products for people that is like it, to decorate their homes with those yeah, sort the, of the wall, the wall mounts. Yeah. 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 I've seen yeah. that. And there's a mind flow. Trophy blacks. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got yeah. the, uh, there's a, there's a, like a hanging beholder. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's creepy. That one. 
Well, the, 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 the severed mind flayer head is pretty creepy anyway, but <laughs> that, is, that is a strange one. We've got a question in live chat there from Mike. Um, he says, are there any setting limitations for when a wave comes out working with specifically with Dungeons and Dragons? So I, I think, uh, yeah, I was just looking at that question. I think that if I understand it correctly, um, the, the thing is that we do um, settings based on when they release from Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. So that's why, you know, you get Wild Beyond the Witchlight right around the time shortly after Wizards publishes that adventure. Um, and then we do, you know, Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures versions of those shortly thereafter. Um, and then Frameworks is in kind of a weird place where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create set lists that, you know, take advantage of that, but also trying to kind of fill in the gaps of all the things we can do with that. Yeah. You know, Medusas, uh, you know, all the classic creatures, Pegasi, unicorns, all of that, you know, yeah. you need to get those in eventually. And the set list can only be so big. I mean, the original set list for this was gigantic. I'm going to pause, maybe trim it down. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're, I, I was quite surprised with the frameworks. What I what I've enjoyed about the frameworks is the fact it is a mixture of hero, uh, heroes and monsters, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that that has been great to see. The um, we've actually just got on screen right now. We have the warlock, and he has this kind of uh, cloak or coat, and it's open. He's bare chested, but on okay, his yeah. chest he has this. Uh, I'm just going to pause it. There we go. Um, he has this. Um, um, like burn in his chest, mm -hmm. and that's not that's not a good paint job. That is, that's in the that's plastic. On the that's figure. on the figure. Yes, yes. It, it, that's it, that's that's Tom Babby. That he put that in the concept sketch, and so the 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 sculptor said, yeah. "How do you want this? Do you want this like inset? Like it's a cut? Do you want it like scar? Like so it's sticking out?" Um, yeah. They if if Tom puts it on the sketch, they find a way to get it into the sculpt. That is, that is so cool. That's, yeah. that's the one where he's summoning the movie because well, isn't it? That's in that's that's just coming out of the frame in in Twitch. Yeah, you can they, just see there's the all. magical effect on his palm and the and the, mm -hmm. and the, and the uh, uh, not not mimic. Why not say mimic? Is that the imp thing? thing? The imp, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it is it again? Uh, we can't kind of fault the 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 design, the styles, everything uh, as much. Uh, Tom's just replied. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> Complimenting. Uh, so, when is we're we're, going, we're about to wrap it up, people? Uh, when is where can we start to see Wave Two? Um, when can we when can we pre-order? Do we have a date yet that we're ready? I don't think we have a solid date yet. Okay. Um, is it I before will the summer? Say, no. Okay. So be, no. late later in the year. Later in the year, we're trying. One of the things we're trying to do, and I'll try to get this in here because I know it's important to a lot of people. Not necessarily, you know, some of the people who are here, but maybe people who will watch this later. But one of the complaints we get from retailers is that the Nolzers line, for example, is getting kind of top heavy. They're running out of space to put it on their wall, so they have to pick and choose which figures they think are going to sell the best. And so one of the concerns we got early on was. This is going to add even more to your lines. It's going to be even harder for me to find space for this in my store. Yeah. Please don't make so many miniatures. We said, okay, we understand. We'll do our best to not overload you too much, which is part of the reason why we cut yeah, the set yeah. out. You know, I, I I was much more ambitious than I think the retailers would have, uh, you know, let me get away with. Um, but uh, yeah, so the idea now is that we'll do several sets a year combined. You know, some Nolzers, some uh frameworks um and you know the other lines obviously they're all part of the same wave um so that they're more spaced out yeah. so that people you know retailers will have a chance to like let some stock go down make some space on their wall make some space on the shelves so they can add these things in there um and so yeah we'll do a couple of you know releases of frameworks uh you know the sprue miniatures whatever this happened to be um you know we'll do a few releases of the the unpainted miniature line um and then that way everything will be nice and steady yeah. as opposed to, Oh my God, I've got, you know, like six cases of, of Nolzer's marvelous miniatures in the back room. And I just ran out of wall space. What do I do? There is a, I mean, we, we got Chav Hunter who's in live chat now and we've had, um, 
and it is something that's, that's hit everyone. Pandemic years and international shipping lanes and delays and Chinese New Year's and, and everything in between. Um, there are there are mass delays all over the world, and we are. It's it's like we are slowly getting things through drips and drabs. Like you say, we could there could be a container somewhere which is full of stuff. It goes out, gets distributed, and only a handful of shops in the UK will actually get some stock, and it sells through so fast. It is incredible mm-hmm. that, um, and kind of in a good way, we've gone back to tabletop gaming because we've we've missed people so they've gone back to the family unit what can we do let's play let's play board games let's play monopoly the the, the you know hasbro are doing really well uh, not just D, but board games in general just out selling it <clears throat> toy shops can't get enough board games um everywhere so it, there has been um something that's good that's come out of it all is literally just bringing back the family unit playing around the, the dining table um my boy is seven. I know Steve's got um, Steve's family. He's got three three kids, but they're all into just doing something new. It's imagination. It fires it all up. Um, getting them around and and getting some different skills, especially when uh, year one our schools were closed and we had a great summer. It's just it's just doing that. So um, I think all we can do is is buckle up and, and wait it out. The, the stuff is out there somewhere it's just got to it's just got to get to us uh, here in the UK we're such a small island we don't think of ourselves <laughs> as an island but we are <laughs> and we're just waiting for stuff to come out over here um, yeah well, with any luck with any luck you'll see Wave 1 of Frameworks next week oh we, is that when who um, how are I was going to say what's the district do you have notice it i guess it's just the distribution handlers who are going to inform you about it's landed it's here it's gone out and which is waiting for more or less more or less yeah um yeah part of the reason um that frameworks uh has taken uh quite this long to come out i mean we we kind of hoped for it last month and we had said you know march and then we quickly changed it to april um part of the reason that any product like that um takes a little longer is because we want to make sure that every distributor that we work with has it in stock. We don't want to, we don't want there to be a perception, even though it's completely false, uh, that we are favoring this distributor or that distributor because they get their stuff first and somebody else is still waiting for theirs. That's not, that's not a good way to do business. And, and it's just, you know, it's a mean way to deal with, to deal with, you know, the distributor levels. Hopefully the distributors do that with their retailers as well. Hopefully they're not, you know, favoring the store down the street and not the one, you know, down the, you know, down the highway. Um, so part of why Frameworks has taken a little bit longer is because we wanted to make sure that everybody that had ordered got their order yeah. before we actually said, okay, now you can put it on sale. Um, and with any luck, the shipping difficulties won't add to that uh, because at this point in theory all of wave one frameworks is at the distributors yeah in theory um and hopefully they'll be they'll be able to get that uh freighted to uh the retailers that they work with in time we will just have to wait and see until they're there but they are again. We're, we're gonna we're gonna end it, wrap it up there, folks. They are highly detailed. They are highly amazing. It is a whole new hobby for you if, you, if you've never done model modeling, uh, model making before. Modeling. <laughs> Going back to that eight pack. There we go. We send photos to Tom. <laughs> um, uh, just JD, just quickly, what is your favorite monster? Uh, of the ones we've done so far, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or a new one, or a new one, or just in general. Or a new um, one. <laughs> uh, I I have to say that uh, the monster that I always come back to, the one that I always like to use, is that Drider. Um, yes. I just love Drider encounters. Uh, I was in a playtest session uh, where <laughs> uh, <laughs> we got pretty badly mauled by a Drider way back in third edition playtesting. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, that uh, that has made me fear them. <laughs> so, 
And what's, like what's your um, install fear? What, what's your what's what's the next big thing that you're excited to do in, for yourself? Uh, in your whether it's a hobby, whether it's business. Uh, you know, I actually have uh, a bunch of painting backlog to catch up on. Um, you know, that, that dragon that I showed you earlier, that, that pink and purple dragon took so much time um, to finish up that uh, I have a ton of miniatures, including a lot of these framework miniatures as, you know, I keep holding them up and you'll notice there's no paint on these. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the I... only one that I painted was the, the night hag, you know, this little... I saw that on your Facebook page, actually. You've got this... Yeah. Um... Uh, like the gradient on that mat, the, the smoke effect as it's coming mm -hmm. out and then it again that it i don't know if it, i don't know if tom did this one you can tell me um there's a little gingerbread man uh -huh, that's and tom. It, it, all right i mean it was something like that again you've got this hag who's kind of you just think it's <laughs> it's ha ha hansel and gretel this is the hag who's who's going to yeah. be there and it's enticing them with a lollipop and a gingerbread man it's a great <laughs> it's a great you've even drawn the face on there how oh yeah, that? oh yeah. And look, that smoke goes from green to yellow. Contrast paint. Thank you, Games Workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need to have a chat with GW. Let's see if we can <laughs> let's, let's see if we can get some get some contrast paints. Okay, we're going to leave it there, folks. Um, all I can say is they are the, the the minis are amazing. Do go check them out. Uh, looks like they're going to be around here for the next few years anyway with waves two, three, and four coming. Um, I've got a dragon. Where does the dragon come from? <laughs> I have so many. I have so Can you. What, what, allegedly. Uh, allegedly, what color might it be? Uh, it might be red or black red? or blue Ooh. or green or white. Okay. Not all Ooh. of them. Not I was going to say, because then do you have different breath? Because <laughs> the, the best. Uh, I know we're, we're going over, but we're like, with kids <laughs> dragon detail, the artwork, every um, head is different. The, you know, the, the horns are curved different ways or the snout is different. So identify what type of color dragon you are. Um, but I was just thinking, is there is there such a thing as a generic dragon? And then you just provide the breath weapon, which then... Apart from a apart from a Dracolich, I suppose you can't really get away with it with that one. But. Yeah, it's that that becomes tricky because they all do have a very distinctive look, and you know, Tom does the dragons for those lines too. So you know, he does the concept sketches for the for the dragons for the pre painted line. So, um, so we've Tom, got all those well established. Tom's just added in the in live chat there. He says, um, if you look hard, the, it's illusionary. The the gingerbread man. And the lollipop, it says it's one bone parts, look. Yeah, yeah. Can you see that there? Oh, wow. And the lollipop is from a famer. Oh, and you can oh, actually wow. see some of the, the gingerbread man's rib cage down yeah. there below. I'm, I'm yeah. going to pin this. Oh, Plus, wow. I went with, the, um, I went with uh, the red object in her hand there. Um, we had two options. One is an apple. And this yeah. looks a bit like an apple, but it's not. It's a heart. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the one with the heart. I thought uh, the apple. I thought that was a really nice touch. That was great. Um, Again, Tom. <laughs> so how did you? I'm going to keep asking questions. How, how how did you find Tom? How do you find your artists? Uh, you know, the funny thing was that uh, you know when I first started on this, Tom was already in place he had already started on all of this and and you know my boss uh said okay we're gonna have a meeting with the concept artist today we're gonna talk about stuff and then the next time that meeting came up he said okay you're in charge of the meeting uh i have to be somewhere else and so okay you know and so from that point on it's you know every couple of weeks tom and i get together and chat and we talk about you know how's the sketch going you know what do we want to do with that hey can we add this to that that sort of thing um and one of the things we've been talking about lately is that flesh golem um, the interesting things you're going to see with that and the, um, it, you know, assuming everything goes well and we actually do get to release this thing and the sketches work out and the, and the sculpting team says it'll work and the factory says it'll work, but all those spare parts that you find with some of the other miniatures that you say, oh, I'm going to use this arm and not that arm. Mm. Mm, it's a flesh golem. Yeah. <laughs> it can use that other arm. We'll no, I'm happens. looking forward to it. Is that... <laughs> Can you uh, is 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 the flesh going to be in wave two? Then are we gonna are we gonna see it sooner rather than later? Um, probably a little bit later than that. Okay, right. 
I think you did mention that. I think you did mention that. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, Sounds well, in production. Yeah. I I, lo- <laughs> I love um uh, I I love I'm a big fan of golems. I'm a big fan of oozes. I like I don't know how you're going to make a, a a framework ooze black pudding that kind of thing. Um, oh, I think that would be very easy. I mean, look at the the smoke effects that we got on the um, you know, on her. Oh, that's true. Yeah. You know, that's that's effectively just an ooze. Oh. Gelatin's cube. Oh, a gelatin's cube framework. Could you like, I don't know, what could you do? Because you can, they, you could assemble the cube. Like the the, the current one, you you've got this the screw off base. You put a mini in there. It's got some slime and skeleton bits. Oh, a framework. Oh, my brain is just going 101 miles an hour now. Um, and I'll let you know that uh, you know Tom's brain and my brain are going 105 miles an hour on that one. <laughs> Yeah, wow. We're a little bit ahead of you on that on that score. Okay. Oh, that's, that's looking forward to it now. Okay. Right. That's enough. We're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there, folks. Um, JD, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, that was really 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 interesting. I'm really um, I love work finding out how things are done behind the scenes. It's not always obvious, and people do take it for granted. Whiz Kids is a, a I think people think it's a huge company. It's not. Um, no, it's, it's really not. It, yeah, it's uh, and the stuff that they <laughs> continue to to do and produce is always blows my mind. Um, and we you've seen uh, the the photos. These are photos, people. This isn't just artwork. These are photos from Den of Imagination. These these are painted mo- models. Uh, there's not like computer mockups or anything like that. They're they're, they're painted. Um, Tom, thank you very much for for joining us and and helping to answer those questions. Uh, maybe next time you'll you'll share the photos. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. You. Oh, are you going to pose for the? You know, so there's a, there's an artist because I'm into comics as well. There's an artist called Alex Ross, mm-hmm. and he get he takes photos of people posing, and he does like the superheroes in normal like normal clothes. So you can see how the clothes would hang. So now I'm just imagining you trying to you know get into <laughs> Tom taking a you screenshot. You may remember uh, that that same kind of technique, um, of fantasy covers from the '70s and '80s. Boris Vallejo. Yeah, uh, yeah. He okay. did the same thing. That's, that's exactly how he did it too. He would take yeah. pictures of people, and you know. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think Brom did the, Brom did the same. He used to sketch over yeah. photos and things. Um, I was yeah. a huge fan of Brom. I used to love that artwork. Um, uh, tattooist all around the world. Larry Elmore, Elmore. Yeah. yeah, Elmore, yeah, um, yeah, fantastic. Okay, <laughs> I've said we're going to leave it there about three or four times. We're going to leave it there, folks. Um, that's, that's what we call a midwestern goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, there's more and more questions. There's always more. Um, thank you very much. Hopefully, we we'll see JD again on. Uh, I was going to say Whiskey Channel on the on the Badgers Channel. Um, and hopefully we get to do some painting and hang out and, and talk some that more. That would be great. I would love that. Cool. Thank you very much, folks. Um, we'll see you again soon. We are back this Saturday with more Pathfinder Malevolence. If you're into haunted houses and things, <laughs> do come along and check us out. Um, it's a lot of fun. So uh, we'll see you again soon. Well, we are back before then, aren't we? Are we? No? Yes. No? Tomorrow? No? It's got moved, Steve. You need to, you oh, need to... okay. <laughs> <laughs> Epic Encounters is next week now. You've got to catch up on your chat. <laughs> yeah, ignore me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So we're, we're back on Saturday. <laughs> right. Cheers, everyone. Stay safe. Be good. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me.